So just to give a brief overview, I'm going to cover some theory with electrical engineering just so that everyone's on the same page. So, you know, if you're a hardware pro, then just bear with me. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then I'll have a midway break for people to ask questions in case they have questions about the theory I covered. And then we're going to talk about the actual power systems on the car. And then finally, we'll have questions again for about the power systems on the car. OK, so let's start out with some fundamentals that are crucial to understand before we can start talking about the power systems on the car. So the three main things that you need to know in electrical engineering are the concepts of voltage, current, and power. Voltage is going to be the electric potential difference between two points. So this is essentially going to measure how much work is required to move a test charge between two points. And this is going to be measured in volts. And the main thing is that it has to be measured between two points. You can't measure the voltage of one point. So in the diagram over here, you see that voltage has to be measured between those two points. And it's the difference between those two points. So it's going to essentially say, how much effort do you need to use to push a test charge between those two points? Current, on the other hand, is going to be the rate of flow of electric charge i.e. how fast your electrons are moving from atom to atom. And this is going to be measured in amperes. And finally, power is the rate of electrical energy transfer in a circuit. And this is measured in watts. So essentially how much energy your circuit is consuming. So in this diagram, you can see that current is going to be a little less as you go forward because there's less voltage that will be applied. And there's actually a relationship between all three of these elements, power, current, and voltage. And the relationship is, is that power is equal to the voltage multiplied by the current. And why is this? Well, if you think about it, how much energy is actually going to be consumed is going to depend on how fast that electron is going to be moving, because you will need more energy to naturally move faster. And also, it's going to require how much effort is actually going to be used to transfer that electron. So that's why voltage is the product of voltage. That's why, sorry, that's why power is the product of voltage and current. So another thing to talk about in terms of current is that there's two forms that you'll see in nature. The first one is DC or direct current, and this is the flow of electric charge in only one direction. And alternating current, or AC, is the flow of electric charge that periodically reverses direction. So in the diagrams below, direct current is going to stay the same in terms of its magnitude and direction throughout all of time, while alternating current is going to periodically change its direction. Now, it doesn't have to be a sinusoidal wave, but that's just an example of how to model alternating current. So some of the applications where you would see direct current is in battery powered appliances. So if you have a flashlight and that's battery powered, then that would be an example of using direct current. Alternating current, you will see a lot more in the sockets that you see in your homes and offices. So the natural question to ask is like, why do we even want to have alternating current or what's the use? Alternating current has a really important application in power transmission. So in the power transmission lines that you see outside, those all use alternating current and we use it because it's able to deliver more power versus DC over longer distances. So this allows you to make sure that the power plants are at, they can be located anywhere and then your power lines can transfer that power over to your home. So that's the main reason why we want to still use alternating current. The next concept to introduce is electrical resistance. So this is going to be a measure of the opposition to current flow in the circuit, and this is going to be measured in ohms. 
since current depends on voltage and resistance, there's actually an equation that relates these three elements together, which is called Ohm's law. So current, which is represented as the capital letter I in this case, is equal to the voltage divided by the resistance. What this essentially means is that if you have more voltage, you're going to have more current. And if you have more resistance, then you're going to have less current. So this is what Ohm's law is trying to state. And keep in mind that this is for direct current. Alternating current's a bit different, but I won't get into alternating current or at least explain Ohm's law for that case. So going a bit more about the resistances, let's actually define what a circuit actually is. So a circuit is just a complete path where electricity can flow. And there are two special cases to consider with what circuits are. So the first one is a short circuit. So this is where there's no resistance along its path, while an open circuit is one where there's an infinite resistance along its path. So I probably forgot to mention this in the previous slide, but there is a passive component that you will put in your circuit called a resistor. This is a physical element and it's used to pretty much reduce the amount of current that's going through certain elements. So in this closed circuit example, assuming that the wires have no resistance whatsoever, the current is going to flow without any opposition. In the open circuit, you see that there's a gap. So this gap will essentially ensure that there's no current that's going to flow to the light bulb. So this essentially means that it creates an infinite resistance along its path. And in general, you want to try and avoid short circuits as much as you can, because if you don't have any resistances, what can happen is that if you have too much current that goes into, say, like an LED, this LED can very easily heat up and then blow up. So, you know, you want to make sure that your components are protected with a resistor. So in general, you definitely want to try and avoid closed circuits as much as you can. And the last one I'll talk about in terms of the theory is introducing what a PCB is. So a PCB stands for a printed circuit board and is used to connect electronic components using conductive layers from copper sheets to allow for more compact designs and to support large scale production of circuits. So if you ever opened up any electronic, you can see that there's usually a green board and this is a PCB. This connects all your electrical components together using conductive layers. So on this picture that we see here, this is actually a custom PCB that we use to control the CAN buses. So this is kind of like a sample rendering of what the PCB may look like. OK, so that pretty much covers all of the theory that I'm going to be covering before we can start talking about our power systems. So I'll try my best to answer questions as I can, but you know, I'm not a hardware engineer <laughs> by any means. And our power systems lead, unfortunately, could not make it today. So, you know, if there's questions I can't answer, definitely put it in the power systems chat on Discord. But, you know, I'll try my best to answer questions as I can. So, you know, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute. And yeah, I'll try my best to answer. I have a question regarding the PCB uh, that you presented in the last slide. Yep. Uh, that one is the board under the steering wheel, right? Yep. Uh, uh, and it's not. The one we're using under the steering wheel right now is like the V1 version of this. There are no components on it, just traces. Yeah. There are no com uh, sorry, can you elaborate on traces and components? Sure. So uh, components are what you see, uh, for example, Oh, actually, never mind. This is the one because right now the controller yeah. unit is missing on the on the car. So you see that U1 uh, on the kind of right side of the uh, of the PCB. There's nothing soldered to that component right now. All we're relying on is the just direct connections between um, select pins on the DB9 connector from uh, you know that, that <laughs> the, the the big the big socket that, that we saw connect, uh, connecting from the uh, uh, from the body controller to the uh, to our uh, PCB. So we split some of those connections into these um, into these con two connections in our 
um, in the individual uh, can buses that we use. The thing is on the left. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I see. So the three left co the connectors is supposed to be one DB2 connector. DB2 connector. Uh, yeah, it does come from one connector, right, Frank? You remember me painstakingly, painstakingly removing that, uh, like that thick connector with a metal tab in it. That's that's where we get our three buses from. Mm. Right. I see. Uh, so in this board, there are three sides. Each has three big connectors. Uh, on our board, we have two sides with three big connectors. Is that right? Two sides with three. I don't remember. I remember only seeing two sides with these. Uh, these but there are actually, in fact, Pushan and I solder the third side. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there are yeah. three. Yeah. But why there are yeah. three? I thought it's like one coming from the car, one going out into our computer. That's right. Uh, theoretically, that's all we need. But the reason why Kushan and I soldered the third side is because we tried to use a vector's canalizer hardware thingy to uh, to analyze the CAN bus. But guess what? We don't have software license for that, so it didn't work. Oh, I see. So the third side just adds a um, CAN node into the bus by like splitting the wire into two. That's right. It's just strictly a parallel connection. So that's why we were hoping to use oh. it for diagnostics. I see. Very cool. Yeah, Frank, yeah that's I, my question. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Frank, I have a question too. Um, right. Yeah, well, sure. why, do we, why do we normally not put um, uh, mains, uh, mains voltage to DC um, power supplies in parallel? Sorry, could you say that again? Like mince peak? Sorry, could you say that again? Yeah. So why is it considered a back, bad practice for us to put two power supplies in parallel? And specifically, these are our, uh, you know, mains uh, power to uh, DC conversion power supplies. Well, why should we not put them in parallel? Oh boy, this takes me back to circuits one. Um, so if you have two, because I think like you could probably just make one one giant power supply, no? Like if you have two parallel voltages, because if you have nodes that are in parallel, that means their voltages are going to be the same, right? So like, why would you attach a parallel DC power supply with another one? Like, mm, I guess right, that's probably why. Constraint. Pardon? I think power constraint. If, um, let's say your uh, one single power supply can only supply a maximum of two kilowatts of power, and our application requires more than two kilowatts of power. Well, what do we do? Oh, okay. Then you would have to use it some order like different circuit in order to generate a larger voltage. Then, like if you want to just like, create smaller voltage, a uh, voltage divider would be would be a, just you know good enough for your application. But then I think if you want to step up your voltages, then you would have to use like a DC to DC converter or something called like a boost boost converter to you know step up a voltage in order for another application. So yeah, I'll talk about like that component later on in our power systems overview. Cool. Um, Frank, while we're on the topic of uh, voltage dividers, why do we typically not use voltage dividers? Um, I mean, we, we do, right? <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure if we have voltage dividers in our system, no? Are we talking about the simple voltage divider where you divide by resistances? But what happens when your impedance changes? I mean, yeah, you can definitely use this. I guess I was referring to like a simple voltage divider for your resistances, but unless you were thinking about something else with a voltage divider, I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Like, why is that a bad idea? To use it just a simple one with a resistance. Mm-hmm. Um. What happens when your load decides to draw more current uh, in, at an instance? What happens to your voltage division? So usually you want to try and at least put some protection mechanisms before you go into the voltage divider. So you would have like a, maybe like a diode at least to prevent the current from, you know, I guess maybe not a diode, but, you know, a fuse of some sort before you can start using that voltage divider. So you would have a fuse before the current goes into the voltage divider typically or some other like protection mechanism. 
I think you can also use like a MOSFET as well to make sure that sufficient current comes into the to voltage divider. So okay. yeah, typically if you have like too much current, then you would just want to try and use like a like a fuse of some sort before you can put stuff into the voltage divider. Frank, well, what I'm trying to say is even if the power consumption is not um, uh, is not over the rating, when the current draw from uh, our load suddenly changes, your voltage division will no longer be accurate, right? Which defeats the purpose of a voltage divider. Oh, so are you talking about like sudden input changes into the voltage divider? No output changes, man. <laughs> oh. Hmm. Well, <laughs> oh boy. I think I'm probably going to have to get back to you on that. I mean, yeah, I think. OK. Yeah. OK, I think that probably has something to do with like transients and stuff like that. I'm not I'm not too familiar with like that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, maybe hopefully when Deere comes back, he can definitely help you out with that. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Just thought I'd br br bring up that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, OK. All right, I guess we'll. We'll move on. I mean, there will be questions again at the end, but you know, I just want to make sure we cover the content before we have more questions. So, all right, let's talk about our power systems at Autonomous. So here's a very high level diagram that we have for our power systems. So, you know, this looks quite intimidating, but let's actually break down each part such that it's more digestible. So the first part that we'll talk about is battery and power. Our power source is the 12 volt DC battery provided by GM. This is an electric battery that can be charged between each session that we do. And this is the main source of power of the entire system. Next to the power, or sorry, next to the battery is a kill switch. This is a switch to cut the power off from the battery. When this is turned off, an open circuit is effectively created. And why do we want to have a kill switch? Well, we want to have a kill switch in order to avoid draining the battery. So if we're just idle or if we're parked in the bay, then we generally would have the kill switch off in order to avoid having to drain the battery and as a result recharge it. So that's why we have a kill switch. And also it's just another like protection mechanism in case like things like really start to break, then we can turn it off. Next component that you see after the kill switch is the bus bar. So the bus bar is a electrical conductor that groups the current from the battery and distributes it to other parts of the system. And we have this in order to create separate branches of our system such that different parts can use the same current from one source. So it gets all the current from the battery and then it's going to distribute that to other parts of our system. The first branch that we have is sensor power. The first thing that goes into this branch is the circuit breaker. So this is a resettable fuse that switches off the circuit when the current exceeds a certain threshold. So the circuit breaker is rated at 100 amps. If you had 101 amps, then the circuit breaker will essentially turn off the circuit and create an open circuit. It's effectively protecting all of your other components on this branch. So protection mechanism to make sure that things don't overheat or get damaged. Now, the next part is a pure wave sine inverter, pure sine wave inverter. And the reason why we have this is because sensors such as the LIDAR and cameras and various other peripherals such as the cooling radiator and the ethernet switch all require alternating current but the battery provides DC current, DC. So we need to transform this into alternating current. And this is what the pure wave sine, pure sine wave inverter is going to do. It's going to transform direct current into alternating current. The next branch that we have is the rugged. So again, we still have a circuit breaker, again, to, as another protection mechanism, behaves the same way as I mentioned in the last slide, but it's just rated at a different current rating. The next part from the circuit breaker is a DC to DC converter. So this is going to step up the total DC from the battery 
to 24 volts. And we need this in order to power the vehicle's computer, which is going to require 24 volts DC for its power. So typically this is a already pre-assembled hardware module for us that we buy off the shelf. But if you were to implement it in the circuit, like I mentioned, I think before you would use something called like a boost converter in order to step up the voltage to a higher level to whatever you need it for. And finally, the last part that we have, the last branch, is miscellaneous vehicle peripherals. So the first element that we see here is a circuit breaker bus. So this is similar to the bus bar in a way that's going to distribute current to other branches. So it's going to have a common source, but it's also going to distribute it to other parts. But it also has the same functionality as the circuit breaker. So if we notice that there's too much current that goes into the circuit breaker bus, then we can also turn off the individual branches as required. So it combines the functionality of a bus bar and a circuit breaker. Now on this branch, we see that the Novotel requires 12 volts DC and same thing for our port hub. So that's pretty straightforward. The next parts that are, need a bit more explanation is the autonomous control unit and blue light indicators. So autonomous control unit, or ACU for short, is the PCB that forwards the CAN bus signals from the car to the computer and forwards the CAN interfaces info to the car. So it was actually that PCB that I actually showed on some slides previously. That's actually the autonomous control unit. And then the blue light indicators. So just to give it more context, why do we even have a blue light? In the SCE Auto Drive Challenge, we required we were required to have a blue light in order to indicate to, I guess, surrounding pedestrians and people that we're going to be driving the car in autonomous mode. So this is a requirement from the Auto Drive Challenge where we needed to somehow turn on this light whenever we're driving autonomously. So the circuit and the hardware that controls that blue light operation is going to require 12 volts DC for its power. So this essentially wraps up this entire tech talk. And you know, if you have questions, feel free to ask. But if not, hopefully you learned something. And thank you for attending. I have a question regarding the first branch. Uh, yep. So the circuit breaker is 12 volts, 100 amps. So the bus bus bar is 12 volts, 200 amps, and circuit breaker is 12 volts, 100 amps. Uh, so the pure sine wave inverter will need to make sure less than 100 amps of current. It draws less than 100 amps of current. Is that right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Again, I'm I'm still kind of newbie with like some hardware stuff, but uh, yeah, I think that would be my answer. Okay, and then the 120 BAC, what what does that mean again? So that's 120 volts alternating current. So that's just um, you know, alternating power pretty much. I see. Uh, so this sine wave inverter. Uh, it says a thousand watts at 120 volts. How much current is that? A thousand divided by 12? Uh, 120? Um, I don't have the calculator on me, but that's like 8.3 like amps. Yeah. I see, and that is sufficient for uh, everything laptop, Ethernet switch. Um, like all of them draw yeah. less than a thousand watts. Yeah, they should draw less than a thousand watts for sure. I mean, it'd be kind of bad if our lighter drew like 2K rod, right? So, yeah. That's true. So yeah, all of these components together need to make sure that they don't exceed like a thousand watts. So, and that's kind of like the issue that we have currently. We're when we're trying to integrate, you know, the the eGPU because our power for for pure sine wave inverter. There's very little power left for, for, for the GPU, so it's kind of a challenge that we have to figure out how to power the, power the GPU. That's true. Can we simply convert to a larger, I mean, a 
a pure sine wave inverter with more watts? Um, if you have like, you know, 5K or lying around, sure. <laughs> it's pretty expensive to to get more more beefy power pure sine wave inverters. I see. You got like an extra thing to the phone at home. Okay. Uh, ben, I believe we had a similar conversation before. Uh, like if you were trying to calculate how much current flows from the inverter to each individual component, it's actually less productive to talk about the exact current rather than just talk about from the power budget alone. So as we can see from this diagram, uh, if the circuit breaker allows about uh, 12 or 1.2 kilowatts max to be drawn from the inverter, right? The inverter takes in, uh, takes in this um, uh, incoming power uh, you know, its uh, efficiency is not going to be 100%. So, its own uh, its own limit is one kilowatt. We just have to kind of add up the uh, power consumption by the downstream devices together, because um, converting like this like DC um, DC current to quote unquote AC current that's that's not a very straightforward conversion, right? You got to be uh, like you got to be very um, specific about what you're looking for, like um, a VM uh, VRM for example. So, sorry, this is a um, uh, mean mean squared average RMS. A room mean squared, right? You can either be looking at room mean squared or you can be looking at max current. Um, so I'm just saying that because the nature of alternating current is literally current that's alternating, you can't really define it by a single number. So that's why when we talk about power budget, you can just take like a bit of a, a simplification and just kind of add your power together and just call it a day. Okay, that sounds good. I, I actually didn't understand like how, what you said. Because <laughs> it's uh, other ways we can right just right. just add add the powers from each device and then that, that's how we get the power budget. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. So uh, my second question is a uh, second branch of the. Uh, the bus part? Yep. Uh, it one? says rugged slash nuke uses 24 volt DC. I think it's just rugged, right? Nuke uses the uh, the first branch where we had that inverter. Oh, I mean, I guess this is slightly outdated because we were still using the crystal rugged, but um, I guess uh, <laughs> we're using the NUC. I guess we would be using it. I mean, I'm, I wasn't too, too caught up with like the NUC integration, but yeah, I guess maybe this is slightly outdated. Yeah, right. I'm just saying that um, if we do, if we post the slides, maybe we should remove the slash duck. Yeah, sure. I would definitely do that. Wait, Frank, this DC to DC converter that the rocket used to use, that's a part of its uh, chassis, right? That's the internal power supply they have. We just included it in the diagram for completeness sake, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I see. So like this whole second branch is like no longer in the car, right? I mean, I think the components still exist, right? <laughs> like I don't think you, we removed any of the hardware, correct? A server, circuit breaker is probably there, but what's the point of having a circuit breaker if there are no con devices that are connected to the breaker? Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, I guess like what you mean is like we don't need this branch, theoretically speaking, for our uses now. But um, um, yeah, I guess we don't really need it. I guess I need to talk to Deer again to see what his thoughts are, but yeah. Right. Sounds good. Yeah, because if that branch exists, then maybe we can use it for powering up radars, right? The downer one, the 12 volt one. Yeah, yeah the circuit breaker bus, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, because yeah, the radars use 12 volts DC, so I, I would assume that you would just create the hardness for the circuit breaker bus to the radars here. Frank, I have a uh, question. Sure. Um, so for the kill switch, um, is there a risk of that if you were to turn on that kill switch? Is there a risk of other parts being affected by it? And if so, how do you guys limit that? So on the off chance that we do use a kill switch, we don't break any of the parts that are currently in the system. So are you saying that like if we had to kill a switch, but then somehow something was still turned on afterwards? So if you turn on the kill switch, is there a chance of 
parts in the system being negatively affected by just having the power cut off at cut off like um suddenly so to speak oh yeah i think so i mean like it's generally not a good good idea to cut the power off for like a computer or something like usually you want to try to do like a clean reset or like you know kill all the processes on a computer and then do that but um i guess i guess in terms of like the actual hardware i think a lot of the hardware that we use or able to take into account for you know sudden changes in your power so I would assume that it should be okay, but if you do a, a lot, then it's probably not a good idea. Thank you. And uh, Eddie, as a side note, just keep in mind that all the all the circuit stuff we talked about, including uh, our power supply, this is all a part of the low voltage system. So the part that's uh, powered by the lead acid battery alone. Um, we do not work with the uh, the high voltage system that powers the motors. So the big battery pack and the motors we do not touch. All this kill switch, it's only for our own hardware. Mm, all right, thank you. Oh wait, so if you turn on this kill switch, I guess like the car doesn't turn off, but just the system that we've implemented into the car does. Exactly. Yeah. yeah the car is unaffected. Okay. Yeah, it's separate with the high voltage and the low voltage. In fact, for the uh, as for the throttle control, we do have a separate uh, switch that's right beside the driver driver seat. That one does not kill power, but instead it sends an emergency stop signal to the ECN, so that all the throttle actions will be killed if that switch were to be pressed. Mm, all right. Yeah. Thank you. Just a really quick question. So, you know, this is a high level diagram of the power system, correct? Um, but like, mm -hmm. I, I guess the one thing that's just always been confusing to me about circuits is that like everything needs to loop back to the power supply, right? In this case, like the diagram, their arrows are only feeding forward and there's like no like, you know, way of it feeding back. So like for high level diagrams, specifically for like, you know, electrical engineering and whatnot, is how do you interpret these arrows if there's supposed to be loops or something. Oh, yeah. So I think in this diagram, you can kind of think of it as like the what components the current will go through, go through and, you know, kind of the dependencies of the components. So let's look at the, uh, let's, for example, how do you turn on the lighter? Well, you need to get the battery power. So that's the, the first step has to pass through the kill switch if it's not off. Then this bus bar will distribute that current to the circuit breaker. Circuit breaker will then feed that into the inverter and that lighter will just consume that power. So when we're driving like just by the car itself though, we don't really, I guess we don't really necessarily have to like loop back, I guess with the individual components, right? Because the lighter would just consume just the power. So, it's not like the lighter will give it back to the battery because the battery should be able to supply it itself, right? But if you're talking about like circuit diagrams with, you know, is that what you're referring to? Like with your circuit diagrams that you see like your yeah, courses? It's more about the, yeah, how this how the current flows throughout the throughout the system, right? Because the current current can't flow in just one direction. It has to well, it can, but it still has to come back to the power supply. Oh yeah, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, I guess of a of a circuit in this case. So I guess hmm, with a battery inside it, there's uh, how do I explain? Because it? it's kind of complex. You can't explain how the battery will get its um charges back. But hmm, let me think. Usually there would be something uh, called like the ground in your circuit. Yep. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, for circuit, uh, what happens is that we have like what uh, he was saying about the ground. And for most systems, at least for some vehicles that I've seen, the ground is normally 
sometimes they use the body of the vehicle to the body of the vehicle is made up of metal so we use the body of the vehicle as the ground so you connect let's say if something has to flow through let's say to let's say something is connected to the battery it would be you send a signal from the battery to the components then you connect the components to the chassis of the car or the like the metal frame of the car and then the battery is also connected to the metal frame of the car that the negative terminal of the battery is connected to the metal of the car so when the current flows through the components from the components it flows through the chassis of the body and then it gets back to the battery because both the battery and then the component are all connected to the chassis of the car. So it's using the chassis of the car as the ground or the return part of the circuit. Ah, okay. Oh, thank so, you for that. So, so basically they could all just have one shared ground? Yeah, I guess that's... Yeah, so they all, normally they have one shared ground. The ground just has to be negative. That's just where the current is flowing through. So they normally share one ground. And then you have resistors to the components to protect the components along the way. Mm, that's pretty interesting. Okay, well, if no one has any other questions, then yeah, thanks for attending.